The second family rule is about control, and not only control of oneself, which is impossible enough, but somehow the child is supposed to control somebody else. That is absolutely impossible. If a person tells another person what to do, the tendency is that person is going to want to do exactly the opposite. There is no way that someone can control somebody else, but in this culture, People are told that if they really love people, they'll make sure they're okay. They'll make sure they don't drink. Then they're angry at themselves and at the other person if they don't succeed. That failure to be perfect and in control is the third rule in a dysfunctional family system. If someone is not perfect and if they're not in control, they've got to blame someone else or blame themselves. This is the main shame trilogy. If one follows these rules, he or she will be incredibly unhappy because at that point, a person feels that they should be perfect, but they know that they're not. They believe that others are, and so the person cannot tell anyone about their own personal weaknesses, leading to an incredible amount of isolation in a family system and a sense of unreality. If a person doesn't believe that they follow those rules, then that means they've never been stopped at a red light and screamed about it, or they've never gotten defensive when a mistake has been pointed out to them. That's the way shame works. A person says, Jeff, I think you made a mistake, and I say, well, you made one too. What I did was I felt shame, which is about personhood, not feeling good enough as a person, and I defensively threw it back at them to make them feel as bad as I did. Whereas if I was looking at simply behavior, which is about guilt, some behavior of mine or a mistake, then the tendency would be to say, oops, sorry, I'll change it. If it's about behavior, then what a person can do is step back, detach, and say, oh, really, where? It's in the interest of the person who made the mistake to change it anyway. It would be a much more peaceful and open world if people would just accept themselves for who they are and stop taking things personally. The next dysfunctional family rule is the idea that feelings in themselves are bad. Feelings are not bad, they're simply energy. They connect us with our environment. If a person gets into a car accident and their leg is hanging by a thread, they are going to feel physical pain and hurt, and they will not enjoy it. But it will motivate the person to get to a hospital as quickly as possible and get it taken care of. That is what feelings do. Feelings are, in reality, neutral. What a person does with them can be negative or positive. If a person is angry and hits someone over the head with a two by four, that turns it into a bad action. But the feeling itself of anger was fine, as long as the person tells the other that they're angry and wants them to stop. Children from dysfunctional families are told in very indirect ways not to talk about their feelings directly. Somehow, they are expected to keep them inside. When President Kennedy was assassinated, John John was looking as the caisson drove by and saluted, and the commentator said, now that's a man. He's not even crying, as if somehow that was good. His father dies and no tears whatsoever. That isn't good, that's bizarre. It makes no sense whatever. Courage is about being able to feel sad or afraid, express it, handle it, and continue on. It is not courage to suppress the emotion. It's either crazy or cowardly. Another major rule of a dysfunctional family is third-party communication. The members talk through another person. So if one member is angry at Sam, he will not talk to Sam about it. He'll talk to Bill and ask Bill to go over and talk with Sam. And somehow, Bill's supposed to make it better. The difficulty is that Sam might not want to talk to Bill. The person is putting Sam in a lousy position. But even if Sam's okay with it, Bill might not want his nose in it, and he might get angry. More than that, Bill has got to hear exactly what the offended member is saying. 
the chances of that are nil. And they've got to be able to express it exactly how it was said, which is again nil. In addition, Sam has got to hear it exactly the way it was said originally, and that is impossible as well. But let's say the impossible happens, and Sam decides he wants to be friends again, and they talk and they're fine. That handles the original situation, but teaches the participants nothing permanent. If they have another disagreement, where are they going to go again? They're going to go get Bill to fix it. This kind of triangulization sets up rescuing. It sets up alliances, and that's what you tend to see in dysfunctional families so often. Alliances and people turning on each other, inappropriate secrets, craziness. It is all indirect, it is all stereotypic. If a person has a problem with Sam, they need to deal directly with Sam. The next rule is to have unrealistic expectations for the self and others. Expecting people to be perfect in mind read is an impossibility. One should always be responsible is another dysfunctional family rule. The corollary here is to never play. Play is a good thing. Play is also practice for living, and it's practice for work. In our society, one of the things that makes us great is that we are neurotic, and we do and do and produce and produce, but we feel guilty or shameful, bad about whom we are, if we rest at all. We are one of the only countries in the world that doesn't take a siesta, a couple of hours in the middle of the day to allow people to be humans and to relax a little bit. Another dysfunctional rule is never to be selfish, and that means that a person cannot do for themselves. It's another crazy rule. It is fine to be selfish. Selfish means taking care of the self. To be inappropriately selfish or to not help other people at all is a problem. In dysfunctional families, it is common to see one person being turned against the other. So let's say, I asked Sam if he would take me across town because my car is not working. Sam says, I'd really like to, Jeff, but unfortunately I can't today. And what I say is, hey, I thought we were friends. What I'm doing is shaming him. I'm not taking his first no for an answer, which he has a right to say to me. I'm going to try and shame him into doing it. When he says no again, what I'm going to say is, boy, you're really selfish, aren't you? Now, who's really being selfish here? In this example, it would be me. In dysfunctional families, there is inconsistency, immaturity, and the use of several final weapons. They use the abandonment or cutoff weapon. If a person doesn't do what they think they should do, they'll ignore them or try to shame them into doing it, or they'll call them selfish, which is closely aligned. If an individual follows these rules, my belief is they're going to have to hide by engaging in an addiction just to be able to stand themselves and their life. In other words, I think that this is the reason that people get into abusive and addictive chemical habits or addictive compulsive habits like being a workaholic.